Hello everyone. Welcome to the third video of chapter 1 for numerical computation. In this video, we will learn how a computer store a number, a binary number in its memory. And this is called a floating point representation. So to start with, let's um, recall something we probably have learned earlier. It's called a scientific notation to represent a real number. So let's say the number is x. Consider it in a decimal base. x is a decimal number, so we can write it as um, plus minus, that's the sign, r times 10 to the power n. Here 10 is the base. So this number r here typically takes value between 1 and 10, and it shall be strictly less than 10, where 10 is the base. For example, you have a number 2345, 2345, you can write it as 2.345 times 10 to the power 3. And if this is, shall be a binary number, you can do a similar thing. It would equal to plus minus r times 2 to the power n. So 2 is the base. So here the r will take value between 1 and 2 and strictly less than 2. So it will be 1 point something. And for another example, if this shall be an octal number, then you will need to change this base here into 8. So it's plus minus r times 8 to the power n, and the r takes value between 1 and 8. And it's strictly less than 8. So to think of a general situation, you have a number base beta, and uh, the number is x, then x can be written as plus minus r times beta to the power n, and where this r here lies between 1 and beta, and strictly less than beta. So um, look at this picture um, here, all these examples we have seen. So we see that essentially, if, um, if you want to store information of for this number, you will have to store three things. So one is the sign. If it's a positive or negative number, you must store that. And then second, the exponent, this power m here, that kind of tell you the magnitude of the number. You need to store that. And then also you need to store the value r. Now we know the computer uses binary numbers. They represent the numbers also with finite length because there's limited amount of memory denoted for each number. So these numbers, we call them machine numbers. So for binary numbers, the value r here, which is called a um, normalized mantissa, well, r will lie between 1 and 2. So if you write it out, it will be 1 point the fractional part. So which means the integer part is always 1. So if we already know a priori this is always 1, then there's no need to store it in the computer. So therefore, in the computer, only the fractional part will be stored for the number. n is the exponent. So if the exponent n is bigger than 0, then we know x is bigger than 1. If n is less than 0, then you have 2 to the power negative power, and then your value will be less than 1. s is the sign of the number. If s is 0, this denotes a positive number, and if s is 1, it denotes a negative number. Of course, we know if computer stores only in binary form, then each bit can store either the value 0 or the value 1. Now let's take a look at how such a number really looks like in a computer. We'll be considering a single precision IEEE standard floating point representation in a typical 32-bit computer. So a number is stored using 32 bit of space. Here there are 32 bits. So the first position here 
taking one bit of space is the S, which is the sign of your number. And then the following eight bits from number one position to number nine, and we call the value C. This is the biased exponent, which I'll explain very soon. And then the between the ninth position and the ten, this is the radix point, and then the remaining 23 bits here, if you do your math, you know, 1 plus 8 plus 23 give you total 32. So this 23 bits will be used to store your mantissa. That's the fractional part of your number. It's 1 point F, the F there. Let's take a look at um, the exponent, this value C here. So the exponent takes 8 bits, so in principle, 2 to the power 8 is 256, right? So it could be used to represent 256 numbers. So we wish to use this C here, these 256 numbers, we wish to use them to represent both negative numbers and positive numbers in an equal way. So if you cut it in the middle, and it can be representing number from negative 127 to positive 128. Okay, so once you have the information stored in S and in C and in F, the value of the number there would be the following. So negative 1 to the power S to give you the sign, and then 2 to the power. The exponent here is a biased one exponent, so it will take the C you store there and subtract 127. And then times one point, the fractional part, which is stored in the mantissa and in base 2. So the smallest representable number in your computer, let's consider an absolute value. Well, that will be when the exponent takes the smallest value, which will be a big negative value, so it's negative 127, and 2 to the power of that is approximately about 6 times 10 to the negative 39. And correspondingly, the largest representable number in absolute value will be where you take the big exponent, so the biggest is 128, so 2 to that power gives you about 2.4 times 10 to the power 38. So it is clear that for a computer it can only handle numbers in absolute value between the x min and the x max that we have just talked about. Well, what happens if you have a number that goes outside that range? Well, so we will say that if you have me, if you give me a number and the absolute value of it is less than x min, and then we say this number underflows. If this shall happen in the computer, the number is set to be zero. On the other hand, if your number shall be so big in absolute value that's bigger than the x max, then we say it overflows. And in that case, the computer will assign it to be infinite. And it will probably return to you an error message. We see that the computer representing a number with finite decimal places will cause some error. So let's talk about the error. So let FL bracket X denote the floating point representation of a number X. So we know FL of X doesn't equal to X, it only approximates X. And due to its round off arrow or chopping arrow, and fx actually equals to x times 1 plus delta, where this delta denotes the arrow. So let's look at its relative arrow. The relative arrow will be the value fl of x minus the exact value it's trying to approximate and divided by the value it's approximating. So you see from the previous equation and this expression here exactly equals to delta. So what is the absolute arrow? Well, that's just the distance between your approximation and the exact value. And so this is exactly the relative arrow times 
the exact value. So in a 32-bit um, single-digit IEEE representation, what will be the relative error? Well, that would depend on if you do round off or you do chopping. So if you do round off, then the error will be bounded by 2 to the power negative 23, that's how small the number it can detect, and times 0 0.5, because that's where you make a decision to round it up or round it down. So it's about 0 0.6 times 10 to the negative 7. If you do chopping, then the error could be bigger, it will be twice as possibly big as the previous rounding off arrow, so it would be 1 times 2 to the negative 23 is about 1.2 times 10 to the negative 7. So it's about the magnitude of 10 to the negative 7. Now let's take a look at something called arrow propagation through arithmetic operation. So say you want to do an addition. So you give the computer two numbers, x and y, and you say, tell me what is z, z is x plus y. So you know when the computer takes in your two numbers, x and y, let's say just a fixed idea, x is bigger than zero, y is bigger than zero, and the computer makes a floating point representation for each. So we denote them by fl of x and fl of y. And these are approximations. So fl of x will equal to x times 1 plus the arrow representing x. And so is fl of y is y times 1 plus delta y, the arrow, the relative arrow representing y. And then the computer adds up the floating representation of x and y, and it gets a new number. And very often, this number might have more decimal places than the computer can handle, and then it makes a new floating point representation for it. So this is actually the floating point representation of the answer, z, that you will receive from the computer. So let's see how does the arrow in representing x and y eventually showing up in the answer of z. So let's plug in. So floating point representation for x is x times 1 plus delta x, and then fl of y is y times 1 plus delta y, its arrow. And then this whole number is being represented again in the computer by rounding off, and then which introduces a new arrow, which we call delta z. Delta z will be the round off arrow for z. Okay, so the rest is just some algebraic manipulation. Let's open this up. So I will get a term x goes here, the term y goes here. Plus, if I take out x, and then it has a term x times delta x, mm -hmm, and it has a term x times delta z. So lump them up, you get this x times delta x plus delta z. And the same thing for y times some arrow. I have y times delta y and I have y times delta z. And then I also have something that I refer to as higher order term. Higher order means that is it's a product of two arrows that's showing up here. So delta x will be multiplied by delta z and give me this term and delta y will be multiplied by delta z and give me that term. So um, think now these delta here are arrows, and we talked about it. It is of the magnitude 10 to the negative 7. So these numbers here and here, they are of magnitude 10 to the negative 7. While these two terms is 10 to the negative 7 times 10 to the negative 7. So this number is 10 to the negative 14, and so is that number. So comparing this number in the end, add them up, to the other terms, this is very small, and we say it's neglectable. It doesn't make a big, big difference. So the whole expression is pretty accurately approximated by this expression, where we drop the last term. Okay, so it's x plus y, which is z, and x times delta x plus delta z times y uh, plus y times delta y plus delta z. Okay. 
Okay, so now let's take a look at the absolute arrow in Z. This will be your approximation, FL of Z, minus the Z exact Z value, which is X plus Y. Taking the previous slide's result, we know this is X times delta X plus delta Z plus Y times delta Y plus delta Z. If I um, break up this expression, so I write x times delta x over here, and y times delta y over here, and the last term with the arrow delta z, those two terms, I collect them and then write round the, round and put them together as x plus y times delta z. So we see, so what is this term here? Well, that is exactly the absolute arrow for x, right? And then this one will be the absolute arrow for y. So this part of your absolute arrow actually came from the arrow already in representing x and y. They were even there before you even started your addition. So we call this the propagated arrow. Okay. And then the last part, it's just z times delta z. So this is the absolute round off arrow that you get when you round it off to get the floating point representation for Z. So it is interesting to observe that the propagated arrow in this addition, when you look at the absolute arrow, it is the arrow of the X and of the Y, the absolute arrow, and just add them up. Okay, let's take a look at the relative arrow. Well, that will be the absolute arrow divided by the exact value. So taking the expression for the absolute value and then divided by the exact value, we get this term plus this term here becomes just delta z. So we see the relative arrow propagated part takes this expression. It's not as neat as what we have here for absolute arrow, but it's some expression. And then plus the relative arrow when you do the round off. I um, hope this is clear, so um, I will assign a homework problem where you carry out a very similar computation as the one we did here when you do multiplication of two numbers. Well, that's all for this video. Hope you enjoyed it.